Rarely I'm in San Francisco because I'm just here in my closet with, with, with you. I'm talking to you. I'm usually in my closet. I said, I'm going into San Francisco. It was dry. And I go in and it just felt like downtown San Francisco felt empty. It like there's no life, devoid of life. I was going to a conference and uh, I just, I, I, I did it primarily because I have to reintroduce the world to me. I have to go back out into the world and see what it's like. And so I thought I'd try this. And, and all this, of course, in advance of my really going out to the world on February 16th. I mean, you see it now, if you're watching, I am going to the frigid fringe. So I, we're going to take a little time to be fringy and frigid right now. Uh, the frigid fringe is part of that whole Edinburgh fringe festival thing that is spread throughout the world, North America, all the English speaking countries. They have it in Canada, here in North America throughout, uh, you know, Orlando fringe. I went to San Diego fringe. I've been to the Capitol fringe in Washington. I performed at, so all those I performed at, and then the pandemic hit and I just, I don't have fringes to, to go to for the last two and a half years. Actually, they, they had some, but I was scared. I didn't, I didn't want to go out. So now I took a stand. I said, I'm going to go to the frigid fringe, but you got to, you got to win the lottery practically, right? Well, it is no, no practically about it. They select you and they, it, they don't censor you. So you can say whatever you want within reason. And I was picked. And so I'm going February 16th to the frigid fringe and I'm doing seven shows and you see it there right now up on the screen. If you're watching me speak right now, uh, you can access tickets for the February 6th. Well, all the shows. I'm playing uh, February 16th, February 18th, the 23rd, the 25th, Sunday, the 26th. There's no football, but Sunday, the 26th, March the 3rd, Friday, March the 3rd, and the final show, Saturday, March 4th, 10, 20 p.m. This is Eastern time. Uh, so for the full schedule, go to frigid.nyc or go to my amok.com page and click on the links and then you'll find this it's Emil Amok lost NPR host found under St. Mark's which is the theater I'm playing under St. Mark's on St. Mark's place and on the lower east side of New York and other stories there'll be other stories I'll talk about my time at NPR and my time at in Harvard my Filipino American history, my American Filipino history, beginning with my dad, because it's all related, right? I mean, as I was putting the show together, these, uh, they're essentially my amok monologues. And if you've seen me perform before in any of those aforementioned places, Orlando, San Diego, uh, San Francisco, in a number of different venues, notably solo fest or the marsh, uh, you know, I, I talk about my life the same way that another solo performer, Spalding Gray, talked about his. Only he talked about his white life. I talk about my Filipino life. And as I talked about it, it more and more, I realized just how absurd it is to be an Asian American Filipino. I mean, going back. And we don't have to go that, that far to get real down and dirty with Filipino American history. My father came in 1928, which isn't that long ago. And frankly, you can begin Filipino American history in the twenties with those Filipinos coming over from the Philippines. And that would give you more basis in Filipino history than maybe 80% of the people out there. I mean, you can include the Filipino American war. You can include colonization, but that's all part of the story of the 30,000 Filipinos who came to America in the thirties, twenties and thirties, like my dad. Anyway, that's all part of the show. And you know what? Because it's absurd. It's, it's a comedy with a little bit of tragedy 
and uh, and a good ending. There, there's there's a good ending. Happy, you you be the judge. Uh, February sixteenth, the New York City Frigid Fringe. Um, Emil Amuck, lost NPR host, found under St. Mark's. And here here's the thing: if you can't make it live, you can go get your tickets. But if you can't make it live, you can live stream it. So if you're in Europe and if you're in the Philippines or if you're in California and say, I'm not budging for you, I mean, I'm not budging. No. I mean, then you just see it from the, from the comfort of your, of your home or wherever. Your, the comfort of your cell phone. You can catch Emil Amuck, Los NPR host, found under St. Mark's. I, I think you'll like it. I, I think I think you'll you'll find it funny, and like I said, I'm I'm learning to introduce myself back into the world again because I have not been out really a couple of times in last June. I have stayed in my closet, but I went out yesterday. I was I was freaking out. I said, "Is it hot in here? Is it hot?" I, I it was really. And I, I just, and I was masked. Some people were masked at this thing that I was at. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it in just a sec. But don't forget, hey, amok.com is where you can get the link to get tickets. Or also just go to frigid.nyc. That's F-R-I-G-I-D dot N-Y-C. Emil Amuck, Los NPR host found under St. Mark's February 16th through March the 4th, various times. I think you'll like it. And uh, here with the wipe, we are off. And welcome to this uh, Emil Mux takeout. My takes on all things considerable. We're here Monday through Friday, live to P Pacific. We weren't live yesterday. We had a, this replay because I was off to the association of a, American colleges and universities, they had a, a big confab in San Francisco. And as I said, I went back to the city and I thought something is wrong. It just feels slow. It feels like there's no one around it. it the vibrance, vibrancy of a, a city just missing. Uh, and I found parking that that's the biggest thing I found parking is yeah, something is wrong, but I was speaking at a panel about hiring diverse faculties and diverse administrators in higher ed. Because I also write for a publication called Diverse Issues in Higher Ed. And I have a secret source, Mr. Deep Throat. Well, it could be a miss. I don't want to give away gender. And I interviewed this person and they told me all the things that a a group of educators should hear and i said if you want to hire people and you want to like hire good people to get a diverse faculty you have to understand one thing the best policy is honesty because without honesty then you're just kidding yourself about what you're doing because then you'll know why you're not doing well enough it's because you think you're doing so well or you think you want to do so well. You have this diversity policy that's like, sounds like, you know, you're going to have a faculty that looks like America. But the reality is you're going to have a faculty that looks like the geopolitical culture of your institution. And if you're in Indiana, that means you're not going to have a very diverse kind of faculty. You're going to try. And then I use the instance of Purdue, Purdue Northwest and their chancellor there who used the Asian slur or talked in an Asian slurry gibberish was reprimanded, refused to resign. And I learned today that the faculty Senate is meeting today trying to figure out what they can do about Keon, Thomas Keon, the chancellor, because he's hung on. He's not resigning. People are upset. 
but I used him as an example here. You're, you're Purdue University. You, you want to be all diverse and you have a chancellor who speaks in an Asian tongue, a white, bald, Asian or American chancellor speaking in an Asian tongue. That's racist. And he acknowledges it. And his supporters even say it's racist. And he doesn't resign. So I was just telling the, the folks there that you got to be understanding about how ideal your diverse policy is, because if it's too ideal and it's beyond your reach, you get stuck with people like Thomas Keen. And then, of course, the interesting thing about the Purdue, the, the whole Purdue situation is that the president of Purdue, the entire university system, is an Asian American. And he had a listening session with undergrads yesterday. And the question was, you know, you could, I was hoping some Purdue undergrads submitted some questions like, what about this guy, Purdue Northwest, speaking in an Asian slur, Asian slurry accent? What are you going to do about him? I mean, the president, Meng Chang, has never, He's only been in my office about 20, 20 days. This, this would be his 20th day. Hasn't said anything. So anyway, um, I have not heard back from my Purdue sources. I did hear from my Purdue Northwest folks, and they said the faculty sent it this meeting. So maybe something will happen to Thomas Keene, or maybe they'll take another action. But so far... That's the reality at Purdue. The reality at Purdue is we talk a good game when it comes to diversity, but do we mean it? Do we stand by it? They don't. Apparently, I mean, how can you have a guy like uh, admitted racist, Thomas Keenan, heading up Purdue Northwest? Can't have it. Can't have that. So uh, that was part of the talk that I gave at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. But the, the most important thing that I think uh, came out of that is that I just told them, based on what my, my source said, be honest. Honest is the best policy when it comes to diversity policies and how you get the most diverse faculty. So you get a, a faculty that actually looks like America or that looks like the nation, right? And I, and I, I didn't say this, I should have. You know, journalism has a bad, bad uh, record in terms of getting a diverse newsroom that looks like America. It can't do it. Every time, it, it, it generationally, it's taken like three, four generations. They're still not where they need to be. And then now journalism is falling apart because newspaper, newspaper business is falling apart. Anyway, diversity is tough and it's our challenge in America. All right. Now I want to bring up all right, now today on the day show. We're also going to talk about a couple other things. I want to talk about uh, David Crosby. He died. That, uh, there's a great Dan Rather documentary that David Crosby uh, was interviewed by uh, Dan Rather uh, with uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, no young. And Crosby says, this was like a couple years ago. Crosby, Crosby, just 81, he says, you know, I want to be able to like continue learning until the day I die. I mean, he's a fascinating man. He was a genius. And for my money, he was like, you know, you think about the music trends, you think about the Beatles, you know, alongside the Beatles in the 60s, there was the, the beach phenomenon, the Beach Boys, right? And then there was Motown. But the only thing American that really countered the Beatles, I think, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Nash, of course, was English, but then they added Young. I can't tell you how many times I played the Deja Vu album today. You know, the Deja Vu album with the double album. The, the, the double album worked like a, a cotton gin. Remember? 
Now, people of a certain age would know what I mean. The double album working as a cotton gin for a certain green herb that people like to roll. And uh, I turn to uh, Professor Daniel Phil Gonzalez. Daniel Phil Gonzalez, College of Ethics Studies, San Francisco State University. Did you get that cotton gin reference? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's kind of vague to me. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Nice <laughs> well, to be here. It was uh, a double album, right? So you yep, had a foot yep. and a half, and like you took, you know, you took a piece of cardboard and. You, as you put these leaves, leaves that had seeds, and you put them up on against the carpet, the, the seeds would roll down. Uh -huh. leaving, that's why it was a cotton gin for a certain okay. herb. Okay. That uh, people now, uh, that, that was a long time ago. That was the 70s, 68, 70. I was just a baby. Anyway. Right. You're just uh, well read. That's the only reason you know about that reference, right? The you social history. Right. You know, yeah. when David, I know you're into music. Uh, David Crosby, he was, I, I, I can't believe how many times I listened to that Deja Vu album. I mean, I liked the, the one, the album with Marrakesh Express, Crosby, mm -hmm. Crosby, Stills and Nash, but that album, the Deja Vu album, that the was a great brown album. leatherette. Yeah. That's classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Classic. How much does it uh, cost now on eBay? I don't, I don't know, but I, I think that was one of the few albums that defined my uh, my high school experience for me. I, I remember listening to that that album just uh, and you know I didn't have I couldn't afford headphones, so I just took my two cheap uh, had this uh, record player had a little record player and put the two speakers next next to I, I, I lay down on my rug next to in the in the living room with the two speakers. On my ears, and that's how I listen to that. And Jimi Hendrix, Axis Bold. Uh, uh, uh. And I, I have the uh, hallucinogenic Chinese guys upstairs. Who, uh, <laughs> they, they were, uh, they were in college, and they saw me. I was some long-haired high school kid, and they said, "Hey, kid, you want to hear some?" Okay, <laughs> they, they gave me Jimi Hendrix. They gave me uh, Les McCann and Eddie Harris live at Montreux. And they give me... Uh, oh, the first rendition of Listen Here. Yeah. Do, do, do. Yeah. Do. yeah. I, I mean, there were some wild, uh, these hallucinogenic Chinese guys. They, they're, there were, there were quite a few, too. See, this, yeah. These, oh, these yeah. Are, these are cultural elements of San Francisco society at that time. You know, yeah. the late 50s through the early 70s, yeah. that doesn't get enough treatment. We keep well, we keep seeing were... the references to Kesey and all those guys, but there was this culture underneath them. You know, yeah. it referenced them, but you know that street, uh, uh, Columbus, was yeah. uh, was a street of musician flop houses. You know, yeah, uh, cheap it... cheap digs. And it's right, you know, it's funny, like Columbus and, you know, not far, I was there yesterday, not, not far away from Chinatown. Uh, yeah. And it was, uh, anyway. So David Crosby, I, I was just shocked when I, I was coming home from this American Association of Colleges and Universities, and I, I'm learning that David Crosby is dead. It's a, it's a shock. Shock. Shock, I tell you. Shock. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so Dan, I know you're a professor or a professor emeritus. Yeah. You might have heard me talk about the uh, American Association of Colleges or Association of American Colleges and, and Universities. Uh, I was actually, you know, I, it was interesting to talk to them. I, I think um, it's really great that you got invited and that they asked you to speak specifically on, on that matter of diversity. You know, diversity in uh, in certain quarters, academic quarters, particularly uh, in ethnic studies programs that were born out of real politic, mm -hmm. um, like the one that I'm retired from, for example. Yeah. Um, diversity is a dirty word. Yeah. Uh, it's right up there with multiculturalism. You know, which, yeah. was, the, which was the earlier 
uh, addition of diversity terminology. Right. And what would you use instead of diversity? It's like, like you said, multiculturalism was the initial word that everyone sort of said, no, that's, the, you know, word of the devil. And then it kind of uh, euphemized into diversity. How can you euphemize diversity even more? Just saying this is what America is or how, how do you s express it? I like terms like egality. Eg oh, it, well, yeah. Just put it to them. Say, look, uh, you mean you got a problem with the quality? Yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah. egalité, though, means even more than just equality, right? Um, yeah. It, it I, means actually observing and doing what's necessary to, in, in the continuous effort to maintain equality. Ah, so it's not just the end result, it's That's the right. process. It's yeah, like, oh, thank you so much. Egalité, equality, equality. You could have had a career in a, academia. Yeah. <laughs> Egalité. No, look, Egalité. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, uh, it was fun being around the academics because, you know, I like them because they don't dress up. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just well, like they the were wearing people. clothes, though. They were wearing clothes. They, they were weren't wearing all, clothes. They, they were. weren't all from the art department at SF State. Right? That's yeah. right. They, they, but the thing about the, uh, you know, I Did guess. Anybody, was anybody wearing like a paper bag? <laughs> I know, but a lot of people, some people were wearing masks. I was wearing okay. a mask. And then I took it off to speak. But uh, there were some really uh, cool people there. Uh, I sat next to, talked with uh, a woman named uh, Sheila uh, Smith McCoy, uh, USF, a very interesting woman, mm -hmm. uh, poet, as well as the provost. Or she's one of the uh, mucky mucks of the uh, of uh, the diversity. And see, now it's DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and what does the I stand for? DEI? Yeah. I don't, don't know. know inclusion? About D inclusion? Diver yeah, inclusion, right. See, I guess DEI, they call it DEI instead of DIE because that would be too, <laughs> that would be kind of scary. It would be somewhat moribund. Yeah. Well, anyway, D, like I hadn't heard of DEI until I went into, uh, until I started being uh, an adjunct a few years ago uh, at San Francisco State. And then I, I'm no longer that. But first time I heard DEI, oh, DIE, uh, no, anyway. Uh, but it was fascinating. Uh, to be there, and um, but I noticed that, like I said, it the the energy of the city was just like seemed like it was depleted. I don't know if it's ever coming back. I know you're still in the city, but yeah, and we like it like this, but we also understand that it has uh, economic uh, effect. Yeah, you know, well, you know, people, people built up all of these huge skyscrapers, mm -hmm. thinking that the culture of the '50s and '60s with people coming into work was going to work. So COVID changed that entirely, but the trend was already there. Yeah. The trend toward uh, uh, remote work mm -hmm. had already been established and um, big, big tech companies, you know, the guys that are under fire now for, yeah, you know, and who are having to lay people off. A lot. Uh, yeah. Google, you know, added, is added onto the list. Microsoft is on the list. Amazon, they're all, Amazon has stopped their uh, smile program, their smile charity program, because they're, right. they're leaving off 10,000 people. Right. And I, I guess the, the, the truth is these tech companies are, they are the, their business right now. They're the business of America in the 21st century. And when America is having problems with business, you know, they the cuts are made in tech. I mean, it's not like they are immune and they can just sustain or continue on. They get cut. And so, you know, this idea that, oh, the tech folks are, they're not business or they're, no, they're business or they're not uh -huh. they're corporate. No, they're, they're corporate. Oh, they're, you know, th that's where all the stock traders make their money on the tech moves, right? Fastest, fastest growing, fastest imploding stocks right so uh that's the reality so if you thought you're being i mean there's nothing counterculture about the tech world yeah people like to put it aside because what's counterculture about the tech world is what is a techie 
You know, what right. are the characteristics of the people who work in that system? What are the characteristics of of the CEOs and the CFOs? Yeah, but you know, you there's no difference between the guys in the you know the sky rises. Operationally, the you're you're yeah. absolutely right. It's business. It's capitalism. Yeah, it's simple. Yeah, and and that I think that's the reality that that hits you. You know, oh, we're just we're just an app that shares. Oh, oh we're. In, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just you know we're just sharing things and <laughs> it's no, what i like ben was uh you know remember when they first started they had child care and free, oh yeah free meals yeah. yeah and recreation time uh yeah. you, know, right when, you know yeah on location yeah. man i was, yeah, I was but, really uh, envious man because some of my some of my friends got cushy jobs in 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 the tech companies Mm -hmm. And uh, they were getting, they had uh, rotating sushi chefs, yeah. You know? <laughs> and and so I got the names of some of those sushi chefs, and and certain people would hire them for parties and stuff. And yeah, hey, uh, I re I remember those those days. I mean, at the early days of tech, I I was only in it a short time, uh, but you know. I, I was in the incubator phase before we got into the fancy. Oh, here's Twitter with all their fancy chefs. They had a big auction. They auctioned off all the oh yeah kitchen gear even, and all even the, the bird. They they auctioned the bird. Yeah, God. So I mean, things are changing. All these tech companies are just regular companies. You know, they, they could have been banks. They could have been, you know, any corporate company. Anyway, uh, so that's what I got that feeling when I was in San Francisco yesterday, and I I couldn't really. A way to get back uh, out or, you know, back out to where there's air and room and space. But I'm doing this because I'm going to this frigid fringe in New York City and people can go to get tickets on. Uh, they can click on away at amok.com or go to frigid, F-R-I-G-I-D dot N-Y-C. Uh, February 16th, first show. I do seven of them. And I talk about Filipino American history which uh, I know you know a lot, uh, Professor uh, Professor Dan. I, 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 I just feel like uh, the more I go over Filipino-American history, it is so Filipino. To be Filipino-American is an absurd exist, existence. <laughs> it, is, it is to live a life of absurdity, which yeah, is right. naturally both a tragedy and a comedy. And... Uh, so that's what my show is about, and uh, I hope people see it. Just a hey, reference to theater of the absurd, which was uh, a little bit, a little bit, but yeah. just just the idea that it you know it doesn't make sense if you're Phil if you're Filipino in America. I really identified with waiting for Godot because uh, I felt yeah. uh, I felt well, hey you know what that does it that's Filipinos sitting on yeah that yeah yeah. Hey, and, and too, too, too heavily subscribed to the myth. Yeah. Well, I I know that uh, listening to you and talking to you in over the last year or so, you know, helped me go deeper into like my father's relationship or my relationship to my father. You know, my father, uh, there in terms of the first Filipinos, those guys in the twenties, that that was it, right? I mean, there were there's settlers who came in sixteenth century. Sure, the, but but we don't have a real record of their settling, quote unquote. Yeah. I mean, so seventeenth century, yes, a little bit more there, but yeah, yeah. So you're really talking about those nineteen twenties guys, yep, on Kearney Street, and, you know, leaving a uh, a studyable body of yeah. uh, of documentation. Uh, thank goodness for NARA, right? You know, the National yeah. Archive. Remember when the Republicans wanted to shut Naira down? Oh, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. Huge, yeah. huge reaction to that. I was so proud. And the, the biggest reaction nationally came from the Bay Area. Mm, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this is where the Asian scholars, you know, and, and look, uh, I think it's important. To, we got to continue noting that you were there uh, at the San Francisco State Strike that began that uh, – that, you know, develop develop multicultural studies, ethnic studies in America. Uh, 
College of Ethnic Studies, San Francisco State University. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason I like to talk to you, but but it's it. You know, you were there at the beginning. Yep. I mean, <laughs> so, so well. So tell me about when you hear that Florida is out to get, you know, is is re- is banning AP Black History from the AP courses in high schools in Florida, saying it's against the anti CRT, anti woke rules that they have. I mean, what what was your reaction? Uh, it's par for the course for the uh, fascist republic of Florida. Yeah. And um, it's completely consistent with their abuse of the term critical race theory. Uh, you know, uh, both personally and professionally, that I have said for years now that when they criticize CRT, there, it's been a couple of years that they really put it up front um, along with the term woke, right? You, you, woke is, is kind of the, the gross generalization, and then CRT is one aspect of wokeness. And um, that what they really mean by CRT is not CRT. It's actually yeah. just, it's just uh, equitable rendition of actual American history. Yeah, that's what they're against. They're against ethnic studies because it tries to tell the hidden, avoided, omitted portion of American history. And we started doing that more than 50 years ago, even before there was such a thing as ethnic studies. There were already authors who were pointing at the excluded elements of American history and uh, the results of teaching American history in that fashion. Everybody's doing it, though. That's the nationalist, right, yeah. uh, method of educating their youth is to build positive myths that hold their nation and culture um, in a high regard, pedestalization, right, of the culture, and by virtue of uh, that pedestalization, a uh, maintenance of the high uh, quality you know, the virtuosity, right, of uh, of their culture and people. Yeah. So then so, it gets associated with people, and then it's racialized. Yeah. And, you know, the pedestalization, pedestalization, I like that because it's like, oh, you there's Stonewall Jackson. You got to quit drinking before doing this show, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, there's Stonewall Jackson on his horse, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Pedalises. <laughs> Forget it, man. <laughs> That's like putting people up on a pedestal. That's right. Exactly. And, uh, you know, well, you know, what I what I don't understand is, okay, I get it. You want to pedestalize these guys and this history, but why do it at the exclusion of all this other history? I mean, other history exists. Uh, well, academic freedom says that you know, you can have, uh, say, a curriculum that uh, focuses on one thing, but expand it to include other things that are true. I see. I, I, you I, know, it, we're, we're in a strange situation in American society because uh, there has been enough truth telling over the last 50 to 60 years that there's a body of knowledge, right? Uh, there, there, a more of a neutral body of knowledge uh, that is a reflection of the actual history. And it's been there and it's been growing, right? Uh, it started with uh, people saying, well, you know, yeah, there's this myth about Washington and the cherry tree and I never told a lie and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But, you know, he, he had his problems, right? He had his issues. I remember I remember when they first started saying, well, these, these are his dentures, <laughs> you know? And it's yeah. like you, they started humanizing George Washington in a very human way, right? Uh, But then came the issue of slavery, right? And people, uh, when we were taught about the Civil War, it was a North-South thing, right? And, and And then over about the last 25, 30 years, there have been scholars that have come out and said, no, no, the entire society was pro-slavery, and here's the proof. And then they started impugning the records of Harvard and Princeton and all of the Yale and all of the schools, all of the donors, 
all of the graduates, right, in the early yeah. days, and they said they were slaveholders. And here's how Harvard's, <laughs> Harvard's income, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, because of slavery. They benefited from the trading that was going on, you know, in New York and Boston. <laughs> well, well, this is this is the real issue now for in, in higher ed at the very elite levels. You know, they have to deal with this past and some are dealing with it very honestly and openly. Uh, UC Berkeley trying to rename buildings. Uh, yeah, they just, well, Bolt Hall, I used to call it Bloat Hall because yeah. that's what happened to the heads of the students who went to school there. But uh, Bolt, Bolt Hall became just UC Law. Right, right. Hastings is now UC Law SF. Oh, I didn't know they changed it. I know that yeah. uh, there's a number of buildings on the UC Berkeley campus. And yep. this is par for the course. I mean, we're going through this uh, idea of, wow, we can't name it for that guy. He was a racist. Or we can't name it for this guy. He started the colonial education system in, in, in the Philippines. He, you know, I mean, on, yeah, and yeah, on, yeah. Yeah. on and on, there's there's this uh, thing going on. And uh, so yeah, I, how, how do you feel about that? Criticizing the guy and saying we got we can't use this guy's name and we don't want to put it on a building because he started colonial education, which means, right, U.S. style yeah. education US style. in the Philippines, right? But, but also, not including just the US pensionado style. program, including the pensionado program, right? right? But, so, but it yeah. also, it's not just U.S. style; it's just the ideas too. It's the you know, content. It's, they used right. American books. They used right. U.S. books. And, and this is also the colonization of the Filipino mind. Yes. Right? I mean, this is this is how. Okay, but but what what you know, there's there's good and bad to the colonization process, mm -hmm. and the proof of that is in the generations of Filipinos that have been educated through that system. Right. You know, UP is still, you know, it was originally modeled after UC. Yeah. You know. UP University of the Philippines. Yes. Diliman. Diliman. Well, that's the main campus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, I, I think it was not wise to do that, but you know, it carried on through, not just in the colonial times, but not wise the for who? The, what, what the, the colonization, the, the academic colonization, the academic colonization, you know, what it was not wise for whom? I, I don't think it was wise for, well, all right. I think the academic colonization, it depends on how, how far the colonization went. Uh, it's good to have the standards. It's good to be, to play in the, in that, the realm. But I think as long as it was balanced, as long as you can get uh, a sense of a, a true indigenous notion of what Filipinos were or what they, what they are. And as long as that wasn't pushed aside and, you know, you don't want to see an academic inculcation, right? You don't want to see a indoctrination. That that shouldn't be what the teaching of a free mind is about, you know? Yeah, well. Well, welcome what, to what my. Do you think, what do you think educational practice was for white people in the United States throughout well, the, the history of the United States? What well, what? How was yeah. education? Oh, you're right. It's probably you know out. for the privileged. Here's here's your story. If you're not okay. privileged, you don't, you don't get it. You don't you don't you don't get to participate, right? So you're saying that the privileged got a fuller and more, let's say, realistic treatment of history and culture, while everybody else got mythology. Or something approximating. Uh, you know, I I don't I think the I think the rich or the privileged got were freer to to accept more of what was there, but they they were exposed to the mythology. I'm not saying they were totally mm -hmm. you know, left out. I mean, because they're the ones who who perpetrate the mythology, right? They're the ones who most benefit most directly from right. the mythology. But but they also are there to carry it on too, and that's why they learned a, a broader, right? They were exposed to the broader uh, reality yeah. of American history because they, they had to know 
that certain issues, certain conflicts existed in order to be able to understand the conflicts, also the remedies from their perspective, you know, the protection of their own interests, and so on and so forth. And so that's now a very exclusive group, right? It's yeah. not just, quote, the elite and the economic elite. It is the elite of the elite, the people who really have the power to manipulate the other 98% of the American and, population. You know? and, and that's because... Everyone's devalued what they what they know. Everyone's devalued what these elitists know. So they just figure, well, I don't have to learn it. They learned it so good. I we don't care about it. <laughs> I, I told I told someone uh, a while ago. I said, well, they said, well, what did you major in in college? I said, well, I was a history major. Oh, and they said, oh, history. Yeah, well, I guess you're going to be opening up a history shop soon. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, see that that kind of shows you where societies are at. That's not just American society. I, I know, you know people, but it, it, people but that find kind history of, useless. Right? Yeah, that kind of attitude was like, yeah. oh, so you went to college, you learned history. Oh yeah, well, I guess you're going to open up a history show. You might as well have been an art or philosophy major, right? <laughs> you know, the only thing lower than majoring in history is majoring in philosophy. It's like, whoa, oh, what no, the no, hell, philosophy. What no, the hell do you do with that? Fun. Philosophy has, some math. Yeah. philosophy has some math philosophy has some math yeah but is it is it is it daily in you know use you know constructive math i mean is it well, like I, the kind of stuff that's represented by the freemasons math well, or it's, way, kind of, it's, a, it's a logic it's a you know you you can well, pick up, yeah you can pick up Bertrand Russell and say, what the you, heck is this? Had, oh, oh, yeah. He used to be one of my heroes until I read what he was, his speeches during the Second World War. Oh, well, I just. That was, that was a rude awakening. I but anyway. Think, yeah, philosophy is much more complicated than people think. But but you're right. You're well, right. And that's why and that's why they don't want to learn anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I Look, I agree. All right, let, let's get back to AP Black history because it, – it's banned in Florida. I think a, I would have loved AP Black History. Right on. They AP Black History in in California. I took AP History. I took AP U.S. History. I took AP European History. I would have taken all the histories. What did AP mean, though? What did it? I know what it means from an academic perspective. You know, from a grading perspective and its value and your GPA. But yeah. what did it mean in terms of subject matter and approach? Oh uh, well, it just it just meant that you got a little deeper into like AP US history. We learned a lot about the frontier theory and Jackson instead of you know just going over the wars and uh, the well, chronology. There you, go. You, got, you you mentioned one big word already, and that's theory. Theory. Oh yeah. Okay. yeah. So well. so we're we're looking at what? Why is there theory in a history course? Some people are going to be asking, right? Yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. well. You know, you're, aren't you're right. facts facts? Aren't facts facts? Aren't they facts? Yeah. I mean, well, look, and and it's just like in English, a, a, AP AP English. Uh, you know, we you had certain poems or poet. There there are poets who are more. Uh, it was based on what whoever made up the AP test, right? The advanced placement test, whatever they felt were, uh, this is sort of like the literary trend and this is going to help you in college or this is what college level, uh, the college level experience. So you guys had to read at Lowell uh, Ulysses. Uh, you know, I didn't have to, okay. not in my class, but I, uh, you know, so it was still portrait of the artist. How about, uh, you know, the Aeneid yeah. and Iliad? Iliad. Oh yeah, Iliad, Homer. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, I I really loved the, the high school preparation, which is really uh, kind of classic, right? In the sense that oh, yeah, everyone they they used to have this feeling or this belief that everyone educated should know these books, right? It's sort of like, yeah. yeah the well, what books. about the band books? Remember the the band books of the fifties? They mm -hmm. included like almost all of Salinger's books. Oh yeah, yeah. I liked Salinger, I, and not just Catcher in the Rye. It's one of my favorites. Franny and Zoe and all Franny, that. Franny and Zoe, uh, yeah. Raise High the Roof Beam, Carpenter. Yeah, you know, I, a whole I, series. he's a, uh, yeah. All right, so look, Dan, what are we going to do about AP Black History? Look, uh, you. We can't do anything as far as Florida is concerned. What you can do is attack it and yeah. state very simply that the only reason to, to, to ban it 
-hmm. is because it tells something about the truth that people don't want their children to hear. It's as simple as that. So are they going to now ban it also or all forms of black history? You know, I saw, uh, I didn't read the whole article. I I need to go back and find it. But I saw an article, sidebar article, Mm -hmm. and I think it was the Times, uh, New York Times, And it said that uh, many black professors are canceling their courses Mm. because they're they're fearing that they could be open to attack. Now, I don't know. The reference kind of said it wasn't just professors in Florida. Yeah. That there were professors in other states that are canceling their courses because they don't want to get fired. I, I I didn't I didn't hear that, but I I know that there's less freedom than you think in a classroom. <laughs> I mean, I didn't I did before I experienced. Depends on it, how many risks you want to take. Yeah, yeah. See, you're well, a lecturer. You're a lecturer. You don't want to take too many risks. Uh, you know, yeah, or you or you don't get asked. Change. Things change when yeah. when you're not on tenure track anymore, but you're actually fully tenured. Things yeah. change because then. Only the promotion to associate and full professor, those are the only things that, you, that you're risking, okay? And, yeah. But when you make full professor, whoa, most of the risk is gone. It depends on the institution that you work for. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, that was a big thing about what I said yesterday, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the definition of diversity in your institution, what that means. Mm-hmm. And as I said, uh, you know, your mileage will vary. In terms, of, <laughs> in terms of the, uh, you know, just how extensive diversity is in your institution. Well, all right. So, look, we've talked about AP Black History. I just think it, it's something that people should pay attention to because it is, you know, if you understand that in terms of politics, uh, we're probably not going to see a lot of legislation passed. We're probably not going to see a lot of, uh, because everything has to be, bipartisan and everyone is dug in in this divided government so nothing's going to get passed but politics will be played because they'll have things like this anti ap black history or anti critical you know and See, it's and there, there, there's a there's a wedge there's a wedge wedgeable crack yes you know, when and, they say ap black history okay how is that distinguishable from black history right Okay. Well, all right. So, you know, you get into it a little more and they'll say, well, the AP Black History course was designed by all these leftists or all these socialists. Right, and, right. And and so that that is sort of I don't I haven't seen the curriculum, but just the idea of banning a whole history, AP Black History, this is the way uh, this is the cult, the way the culture wars are played today. This is the way that right wing conservatives, mostly white uh, try to put that wedge between society by saying that anything that is critical of America, anything that is critical of whiteness is not good for our country. Right. There you go. Because because we ought to be rah-rah. We want rah-rah history. All we of want- these issues were the basis for the uh, banning of uh, Mexican American history, the teaching of Mexican American history, the teaching of La Raza or any form of Mexican American history in Arizona. Do you remember that case? I don't it, remember it's that like one. 10 years back now. Hmm. And it came here to the Ninth Circuit um, and, and it won. The people oh. who, who wanted to ban ethnic studies, and, and by that they meant stuff with Mexican American historical content. Yeah. And it won, and and I was more than disappointed. I was I was shocked and and uh, ang- and angered by the decision by the Ninth Circuit. And this is the circuit now that that the right wingers and just moderate Democrats love to say yeah. is a radical left, uh, uh, you know, bench. Yeah, which so is, woke which is yeah. not true. Yeah, woke. See, yeah. whenever whenever people catch on to a term, uh, and and it's been in use where it originated for for fifteen years, and they catch on to it in the in the 
at the earliest in the 10th year of its existence, or more likely the 7th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth year of its existence, they have a different a, a, a definition or an understanding of what that word means, woke, right? That is largely divergent from the original meaning as it was used in the cultural context of its originators, okay? Mm. So the term now is being used as an epithet. Yeah. You know, by by white nationalists. Okay. So you have, to, you have to accept the fact that it's white nationalists and very frequently Christian white nationalists yeah. that are using the term woke, okay, as a target, right? Yeah. They're using the term woke as a denigrator, literally yeah. a denigrator. And, and they want to create this woke bucket and put everyone in it who is black in any way, or person of color. Yeah, because, that's right. You know, and they'll put, if, if you're, you know, in the AP Black History, you're in the woke bucket. It, they'll yeah. put it, and it, it's all intended to define the new political divide on race. Because if they said that, oh, you know, the... If they just, if you just call it what it what it what it is, it's an attempt to institutionalize racism in American thinking and culture. Uh, then you'll say, "Oh, you're crazy." They're they're just trying to keep us from the woke. Look at the woke. Uh, look how bad the woke is. They're the woke criticizing is America, and the America should toxic. not be criticized. That's right. You the know, woke is toxic, man. It's going to change. The, your, it's going to change your DNA. Right. Let the Chinese criticize, uh, you know, China. Let them criticize America. Let the Russians criticize America. We shouldn't credit. Americans shouldn't criticize America. And if you're criticizing America, you're woke. And you go right. in the woke bucket. Well, I, I'm glad to be in the woke bucket. Yeah, I, th I think there's a particular racialization, right? I mean, yeah. you know, wokeness has a particularly racialized aspect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the in the view of the critics that are abusing the term, yeah. So it's like you know, it's like the popularization of a dance that started in in black society, right? Remember how long it took them to to get the twist? Yeah, the twist. <laughs> the the twist. twist. Yeah, the twist and, and, was. And there was a white way of doing the twist. <laughs> uh, the, another yeah. one that I thought was really interesting was the jerk. And the, this there is was the jerk. a white way of doing the jerk. <laughs> what about the teeth? Uh, no, it had a curl. It had a curl in it. It had this curl. It was yeah. almost the, the Filipino or Southeast Asian dance curl. Yeah. yeah. So, the yeah. jerk. I remember the jerk. And then there was the cool jerk, which was yeah, a very good jerk. jerk. Yeah. My, my, my favorite was uh, the twine. The, oh, the twine. Twine time. Twine time. Twine time. Twine time. But, yeah. but uh, now, actually, you know, my favorite was uh, Mother Popcorn. <laughs> yeah, and there was there was there was both black and white music that you could do m m Mother Popcorn to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Credence Credence Clearwater had a whole slew they did of popcorn? hit. Right in a row, and people with popcorn that Creedence Clearwater. Oh, you know that's true. That's true. They they came out the white John Fogarty, yep, and his brother and Doug Cook from El Cerrito. That's right, <laughs> California, and and they wore those plaid flannel shirts. But I was so surprised when, uh, like, remember American Bandstand when it was still on? They had a dance contest, and they had a Creedence Clearwater song right. as the dance song. Hey, they were they were kind of like the stones they did yeah. a lot of they did a lot of black music and yeah. and West Coast, uh, yeah. You know, yeah they're good yeah i like i look i like john fogarty and yeah. uh now, now we're going to talk and uh, now we, we talked about Crosby. i like crosby but if, if you haven't seen that dan rather interview with with uh crosby, with David crosby. Yeah. it's on youtube it's free um dan rather did it for Axios, I no Axis, A X S. Yeah, Axis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it it was a really a great interview because because Crosby was, you know, he comes across he, like he's the man's a genius, but he was screwed up. He went through drugs and all that. But at, at you know at the time of this interview, he was just 
man, you, know, you, were the guy who up the, you were the guy that brought up the cotton gin. Yeah, you know? well, look, he was. There was full. a whole lot of cutting and sorting going on on those album covers. Then he just, was full of gratitude. Yeah, he, he was just so. I just you know, and I'm. We I'm used sad. to call it the Keef. The Keef. The Keef. <laughs> get the when Keith. you sort out the tops. Oh, yeah. sort of the tops uh, and the bottoms. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> no, that's a whole different thing. That yeah. was Andy uh, Warhol. Oh yeah, different Andy Warhol. Yeah, yeah. All right. Andy so Warhol, now, look, uh, Lonesome Cowboys. Yep. <laughs> so now, one one of the things we, I I had to skip yesterday because I had to go down to that uh, San Francisco thing, but I you know we hit the debt ceiling limit yes. on Thursday and we're gonna yeah. work it out. It's like and, bumping your head on the toilet lid. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is really crazy because a lot of people they they want to bring home the 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 argument that oh well this is like hitting your 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 credit card limit you just raise it and yeah it's a little like that but it's also a little more like uh it's more explosive more nuclear when you don't do a thing you know when you don't when oh. you, you choose oh, absolutely <laughs> and, and now all this is really it's just economic i have, I have two people. words i have two words that you can research that that will show you what happens when you do debt limit bull crap and yeah. the words are ted cruz ted cruz <laughs> oh yeah yeah well i just in one senator you know bring the whole freaking u.s economy and half of the rest of the western world to the brink one fool and this guy still wins elections yeah, yeah. Because well, he's I, from Texas, where they yeah. don't even understand how to spell their own freaking state name. Well, anyway. whatever you want, Ted. Whatever you want. It's like I, I don't know. They they can't they can't be in Texas, they can't be Cruz, they can't be Abbott. Yep. I, I I just uh I, I I like Texas too. I've lived they're, there for they're making inroads though. There's a lot more uh you know Latinos, yeah, mostly really Chicano. Uh, or, you know, that they're getting elected different. on the local level, right and left. OK, uh, there's a lot more women at the getting elected local level. So I think you're going to see state legislature creep yeah. in Texas. The next election, you're going to see more gains uh, at the state legislature level. When that happens, uh -huh. OK, then you're going to see uh, Abbott the, and those guys gone and the kind of people that do Abbott things. Yeah, um, I, I, I hope think. so. I hope so. Yeah, I mean, it, it may take two elect presidential election cycles, but it's happening. Yeah. Well, you know, this is the thing. I I don't think Congress is going to get anything done. I, I think they'll posture. It'll be more like, uh, you know, sniping and a lot of rhetoric and a lot of, you know, nothing's going to get passed. Um, and so the action will be elsewhere. The action will be at the state level. You know, and things like abortion, um, the action might be at the the court level to see there what's, it is. That's what's exactly going what I was on. Say. That's what's right. Going That's on absolute, with the, absolute agreement. Yeah, with uh, Supreme Court, the court level. Now, uh, I think it's now about two years ago when people were talking about how toxic the effect of uh, quote Trump era Trump appointees right to the courts. Mm -hmm. How how negative an effect that's going to be and and people were acting as though uh the republicans and more specifically the trump trumpers uh were going to go to the courts and they were going to get favorable decisions simply because the courts had been pre-stacked with judges and justices that came from the federalist list okay yeah yeah and i i tweeted very simply there's going to be a lot of conservative judges on that federalist list yeah. that are just going to do the law because that's what they've always done. They're going to make decisions based on the existing law. Remember, one of the big criticisms that conservatives had of uh, so-called liberal justices was that they were legislating from the bench. Remember that? Remember mm -hmm. that criticism? Yeah. And yet... Any even even fair appraisal of Supreme Court decisions shows you that the people who legislated most from the bench were making conservative decisions, restrictions so, on rights. So, so what are you, are you saying that they're going to be um, 
a lot more. They're not going to be as. They're not going to be successful, and because they're going to go to the courts, look at what's going to happen. They're going to they're going to file uh, 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 investigations mm -hmm. against whoever they 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 want to disgrace and 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 tarnish in the public eye. That stuff is challengeable. Yeah, that is challengeable. Is, is this an appropriate use of congressional power? Who gets to check on that? The executive, right branch. And who else? The judicial branch. And so right. the executive branch or citizens, just plain old citizens, all you have to do is show that your interests, your constitutional rights, okay, yeah. are being violated by a certain group's actions. And if even if it happens to be right, uh, committees of Congress. And so they're going to be they're going to be up against the wall. They can you know, they keep saying they're going to come after people. And I keep saying against my at my yelling at my TV, bring it on, you idiots, <laughs> because that's uh, what they, I want them to do that. I no, want them to do that. It's going to backfire and just be a kind of waste of time. But but that's what we have. We have we have two years to go through this. The important trade. consideration is that the independence that you know that that's the increasing category right of american voters is more people in the independent category and and they become national and in statewide swing voters okay? right the important consideration is that those people the the majority of them i think may be voting more carefully than either those who habitually vote democrat or habitually vote republican Ah, so you know. it's going to force us to be smarter. I think. I think so. Some, you know, some, people, for some, maybe for some, and I think it's enough. I think that margin is going to be enough to make a difference. I, I hope you're right because yeah. you know the things. You know, I, I don't even want to mention George Santos now. But <laughs> I thought he, we were going to talk about this for sure. People I mean, mention. I, uh, last people week, mention him you know, a lot. I couldn't do it, but I mean, this week. For sure. And, you know, and, and it's a good thing that it was put off until this week. At least our discussion was put off in the, because yeah. so much more stuff was found out. Right. Yeah. Uh, About, you know, uh, the, the reporters that that pop, you know, his first uh, layer of lies. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they're finding even more. And it's even like, more. well, some are kind of, you know, crazy. Like uh, the drag queen thing is sort of, uh, you know, why is that crazy? It's not well. It's not great. Well, I I just don't see it as relevant. As I mean, so if it's true, well, uh, but he's a, he's a right winger, and yeah, right wingers but, right wingers have been showing up at school board meetings, right? And, and when, going when after drag queens are telling stories to kids, right? Right. No, I mean I see it's relevant, but uh, you know he is the first openly gay Republican, and it, it's one of those strange things to. To have it's embarrassing more than it is necessarily disqualifying, unless uh, actually that might get him some Democrat votes. Oh well, he's a drag queen, but then he denies <laughs> it. He God. denies it now. So oh no, man. Yeah. So I. But and then the, uh, the one that came out about his. We his might mean that if we ever get invited to judge a, 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 Kappa. a contest. Yeah. Don't did, don't. Did we did don't we ever get me. invited? Do not call me. Did, I I was invited once to judge uh, Gappa's uh, pageant. Okay. It did, How'd that work out? We, did we do that together? I guess not. No, no, we you didn't. Would <laughs> I would remember that. I Look, would remember. I, it that. was it was a lot of fun. I I would say it was. It, it is. It is. It is actually a lot of fun. But it it's just probably you know. the most fun I've had without my wife. <laughs> No, no, no. no. There's I, a question of degrees here. I, you know, okay, no, I'm looking at messages to see if Kathy's listening. To you. No, I, I, uh. I judge that. Maybe it was about 12 years ago. It was a lot of fun. I knew a couple people who uh, were, uh, you know, they were sponsors of Gappa, and so they invited me to be a judge. Not that I'm a great, you know, judge of that kind of thing, but <laughs> it was very, it was very entertaining. And, uh, you know, I, I do have, I have a, a family member who married a, a drag queen. Okay. I, you know, so I, I went to the drag wedding.
couple of years ago, which was fun. Fun those drag weddings. Hell yeah. No, and, they, yeah. and they had it at Fairyland in Oakland. <laughs> in Oakland? In Seriously? Oakland. Seriously, they had it at Oakland Fairyland. That's, it was like, a lot of fun. Lot that of fun. is too cute. That is just, that is too cute, man. Okay, so getting back to uh, <laughs> okay, George Panthers. Lost for words. Lost for words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, she was gone. She I was on guess. a business trip. She was on a business trip. Right, right. Uh, That's what they all say. <laughs> yeah, she's on a business trip. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so, so, Dan. Um, this is going to be fun be the, next time, the next time we go out to brunch. This is going to yeah. be some fun. But go ahead. Okay, so George Santos, man. We got to get serious about a, George. What is gonna, he indicative of? He's going to be around, right? Uh, uh, what, not, not for that long. I don't think he's going to make think? it a year. I, I don't think he's going to make it a year. I think he's going to become way too much of a liability. And, um, you know, they're, they're at least not going to have him sit on committees. But, you know, yeah. look at, you know, MTG, right? She, she, she got put off committees. Yeah. And that left her time to just say and do all kinds of crazy stuff on the side, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, so he's on, George Santos is on small business, which I guess, you know, drag queen <laughs> performer is a small yeah, business. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of jokes for that. It's all about yeah. size. Yeah. But, but. And, then, <laughs> and then, and then what, and then he's on the science uh, technology committee, you know, and when I was working in Congress way back when, um, for uh, Congressman Mineta, then Congressman Mineta, science and technology was a big deal. Yeah, and it's big going deal. to be again. It's it is again right now. It's big time. I think uh, two maybe, different directions, right? Yeah, you know and, the climate change direction in one instance, mm. um, and the other one is uh, space exploration. So, yeah, space is going to be big, big. Time. and then big also, time. you know, are they going to redesign the costumes? Of the <laughs> I mean that—that that is critical. Do you want them looking like Star Trek? Star Trek? You want them? You want, them you want them looking like the Tang? Oh, no. You want yeah. them looking like the Tang guys? As long as it's not musky, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Be, I, it can't. It can't have anything to do with Mister Mister. You know. Yeah. Well, I just think that um, George Santos. I hope you're right. I hope he does. I hope he's not long for the world. Um, you know, I want to. Uh, well, you know, he's he's prosecutable, and I'm I'm I don't know if we have an extradition treaty with Brazil. Yeah, Brazil's coming but, after. But yeah, oh, and, and then also the whole thing about the money, right? Who gave him the seven hundred thousand, and that he gave that he gifted to himself in the campaign? Well, yeah, well, he. But see, there's even more there because there was an inflow of a couple of million. Oh. The seven hundred thousand is only about you know self financing, right? You know, ah, so where did the money come from? There's so other there's money. other money as well. So where did it come from? Who's funding this guy? And he says, I sold, I, you know, I was doing real estate and I sold a few, you know, high end uh, properties. You know, yeah. That's what he said. He's a trader. Right. Uh, you know, next thing you know, he, you know, he found a copy of uh, one of Michelangelo's lost works. <laughs> you know, you know I, I just I'm just glad he doesn't say he's Filipino. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would be bad. I mean, that's... yeah, well, you know, when we're looking at him, you could say, well, this guy could pass. This guy can actually <laughs> be Mestizo Filipino. Please don't be Filipino. <laughs> he can lie. Guy, to him. Remember the guy that had all the pro Trump stickers all over his van and stuff? Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah he was... and, and he looked he looked very Latino, but then we're all thinking, wait a minute, but his kind of what tipped off us off that you know he might be Filipino? And it turns out he's Filipino. It's like, oh no. Yeah, I for, I forget his name, but I did a big thing on a big story on him, a column on him because you know he was the show of diversity, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, for, for no. oh. So, all right. So, Dan, uh, I'm going to cut our time short here because I, I I have to go off. But before we leave, uh, you know the 49ers are playing the Cowboys. Oh, and, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> The cowboy, the forty oh, nine are they're favored only by three and a half points, but uh, I think the forty nine ers are going to win. I yeah, think. I think they're going to win too. And and you know I've been saying all week to anybody that you know talks about it, it's it's our defense. It's going to be our defense. 
RDMs. Okay, I I think you're right. I I like Brock Purdy. I hope he, you know, he's really good. I mean, he's a he's he's got a lot of characteristics that show a level of maturity that belies his age. Right? Or is being the last person taken in the draft. Yeah, Mr. Irrelevant. I want a Mr. Irrelevant jersey, man, and you can't get him. I'm going to have to make a fake jersey. A fake Number 13, Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah, I just like it. it. It's something. Now, I, I, I'm, I I'm think I've become, as an emeritus faculty, I think I'm now Mr. Irrelevant. So it has it has a double meaning for me. <laughs> Listen, oh, you're never irrelevant, Dan. You're never I irrelevant. I don't know. I don't know. You never so so yeah, but you know you, that that the desk they gave you in the corner next to the exit door. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason why it's there. Yeah, that no. really hurts my feelings because it reminds me of how they used to seat us when we went to white restaurants. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, they put us near the restrooms or near the double doors with bus boys flying in and out. Right of the near the kitchen. That's I right. Knew. I, I tell a story. See, in my even show. you, I mean, you, you know what? You're, you're almost 10 years younger than me, and you still have memories of that same kind of. Oh, act, yeah. Act. That's I, the way I, it was. I, I was at, when I was at NPR, I would go to a restaurant and I would go up to the cash. After eating, I'd go up to the cashier and ask for a check. And she said, the bus boys get their checks on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that is so cool! I, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, one of my former students who's also a, a good friend. Uh, I think I'm, yeah. I'm God Godfather of his daughter. Uh, was at, attending a a major event at the Fairmont, and he was wearing a tux. Ah, and and, and he had developed a cigar habit, right? Oh, because he's cool. an attorney, a practicing attorney, and of course they do cigars and scotch, right? Yeah. And he, so he, you know, he went outside to do a cigar, and as he was finishing up, uh, he was uh, standing near the uh, the corner of uh, California and uh, whatever that is, uh, Powell. Oh. And, and he, uh, and somebody says, gives him slaps five dollars in his hand, said, "Hey man, do me a favor, call me a cab." <laughs> I know. Uh, so I said, "So what did you do?" And he goes, "I called the son of a bitch a cab." <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. I mean, all right, he's of a certain generation because it wasn't an Uber. Yeah, see, well, yeah, well yes. But, or a Lyft. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but, you got to use still, your phone to do that, you know. And when and, you're in a hotel district, you can wave down a yellow, you know. Man, I'll tell you, though, one time I, you know, because I drive a one of those cars that are mistaken for being an Uber or a Lyft, and I was parking outside a hotel waiting for i know i was waiting for something i was waiting for a friend to come down uh because people convention. kept on opening the door <laughs> everyone opened the back door wanting to get in and thinking like what the hell uh who are you <laughs> yeah 14th and market please <laughs> <laughs> i know it was uh anyway hey so so dan always nice uh talking to you and yeah. uh this was, even though we didn't spend that much time on why is George Santos even why does it even happen right that's what you really need to to so why, need right, to understand why that. does it ha it happens because they don't well, vet their candidates man people, people, I mean you know they just they don't vet their candidates yeah and so how do you get all of these crazies and you know keep doing it I love it. Please do more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 I I can't I, I just can't believe that that he won. And the guy he beat apparently was a pretty good guy, but man, uh well, he, you know, look at his resume. The way people look, you know, saw his resume, it was like, no, man, that this is this guy's way more qualified for the right. job. Here's the guy. Here this George saying, you know, man, look at this. <laughs> Hey, I got that from students the last tour, man. They said, Yeah, oh, so people are saying all the Russians want is what's theirs. It's it's been theirs, you know, Ukraine was theirs. And and then they said, Well, how do you explain that? And I said, Well, who's saying it? You know, other students. And I said, Are they Russian? Because <laughs> there's a substantial Russian population in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. And there's yeah, a substantial yeah. Russian population at SF State. Okay. Yeah. But there's two two groups though. They're Russian Jews, yeah. and they're Russian Russians. 
yeah, non Jews, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. and 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 so these guys must be in contact, and these are these are students of different colors. Yeah. You know, uh, one was in African America, and this was going on in my class, and and then they said, "How do you explain that?" And I said, "That is the Russian imperialist historical, the imperialist nationalist position." Okay, yeah. so you got to go go back to read anything about like the last czar, okay, or, or and uh, Catherine the Great. That's you don't only have to go back that far, and you will see this Russian sense of empire. And I and you know I said the irony is it's a Western wannabe sense of empire. Everything that they were doing, they were trying to imitate. Where do you think Boyle's Bolshoi Ballet came from? Yeah, they, well, they wanted to Frenchify their own culture, right? You know, and this is this is like uh, the Philippines when once the Americans came and colonized the Philippines. Yeah, all of a sudden it's we. And what yeah. do they mean by we? You know, us and the white guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, Dan. Okay, but our, our parents' generation, our dad's generation, you know, America <laughs> is number one. <laughs> okay. I, I know. I, I, yeah, that, they're, doing, that, they're doing number one all over us. <laughs> yeah. And that's what my show is about. Yeah. So, and I, I hope to, I'll call you and I'll give you, we'll, well, I'll talk to you off, off, off campus, off campus. Okay, yeah. Can you get me in, man? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I I can't. I can't. Hey, listen. <laughs> no, Dan I'm kidding. Vidal. I'll buy a ticket. I'll buy a damn ticket. But you Professor know, Professor, D- buy, buy a block. Buy a block of tickets. Buy a block of tickets. <laughs> yeah, and give them to your friend. No, uh, Dan Gonzalez. Give them to my friend. I have one friend other than you. So yeah, Professor of Ethnic Studies, Professor of Asian American Studies, Philippine American History. College of Ethnic Studies, San Francisco State University. Professor Emeritus. Emeritus. Always, a, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure having you. Way retired. Uh, and indeed, uh, the pleasure and honor, sir, kind sir, is mine. Ah, no. Okay. No. All right. Well, D- Dan, your Dan. wisdom and humor is not only beyond reproach, it's above your pay grade. <laughs> hey, that's the way a Filipino would say that, that you're going into that kind of the florid. Kind of. That's right. That's yeah. right. You know, I think you're at the O one level. You know, <laughs> military pay grade. But anyway, at least you're hey, not. What the hell, Dan? Go, go Niners. Go Niners. Go Niners. And, uh, I think it's going to be we'll, our defense. We'll I think watch out. Uh, Prescott is going to be on the run. Yeah, let's hope. Literally. Let's. I hope. I hope. You know. He's, yep. Let's. Well, it's going to be a fun game. I mean, everybody's stacking up for this one. This one. Yeah. It, this one harkens all the way back to. Yeah. Oh yeah. The 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 catch. The catch. Yes, exactly. The catch. All, all right, right, dude. All right, Dan. Take care. Right. There Take he is. Care. Dan See you, Gonzalez. Kathy. Looking forward right. to our next uh, meal together. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Dan Gonzalez, College of Ethnic Studies, San Francisco State University. My good friend. You know, we have them on on Fridays. We, we we didn't have them on last Friday. I don't know why. Oh, we we had something else on. But look, we repeat this on Saturday and Sunday. So if you missed it, so uh, we're we're at this point now where, um, God, I, I want to talk more about that show. You know, especially after I talk to Dan, because I mean he confirms. I mean, you know, we're talking about. It's Filipino American history is what I talk about in my show. Emil Amuk, lost NPR host, found under St. Mark's, and um, it's a solo performance. It's you know kind of comedy stand up. Some some stand up. There's parts where I st- actually stand up and tell jokes, and then solo performance where I, you know, I emote, I solo perform. And then I story tell, like I, I don't recite lines. I actually you know, just tell the story. I do not dance and I do not, although there could be some dancing. There could, I mean, if you count the time I do a kind of Filipino salsa step, that, that might be dancing. Uh, seven performances, February 16th to March 4th at uh, the Frigid Fringe, frigid.nyc. You can get tickets. And uh, if you're not going to be in New York, say, come on, Emil, save your breath. I'm not going to be in New York. Oh, well, you, you can watch it in Daly City. You can watch it in 
Manila, if you're saying, I'm riding the jeepney at that time. Uh, you know, no, you can, you can actually watch it on your cell phone if you're in Manila. Why not? I mean, all different times, weekdays, weekends, between February 16th and March the 4th. Fun show. I talk about Asian American Filipinos like we matter. And and I'll tell you, here's here's one. I did the show 2018 and 2019, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, but the reviews for, for the first iteration of the show, this is sort of like 2.0. Uh, this was at, at the San Diego Fringe. San Diego Story, it's a website. Excellent, they say. Emil Guillermo knows how to tell the story, and that ability sets amok monologues above other solo shows. What can I say? Unsolicited testimonial for uh, Emil Amok, uh, part of the Amok monologues. This one, this iteration, Lost NPR Host Found Under St. Mark's and other stories. It's at Under St. Mark's Theater in New York City. And if you can't make it, tickets are live streamed. Go to Fringe or Frigid, F R I G I D dot N Y C. And if you want this exact page that you're seeing now, uh, go to amok.com amok.com and uh, you can on amok.com you can uh, go directly to that page that has uh, the uh, the ticket link so that page that page you can go directly to that page you, you know it's the right page because it has the, the graphic so there so i i've been doing a lot of uh, meditation lately part of preparing for the show has really been you know dealing with the possibility of covid rising you know trying to stay safe trying to stay healthy but also the, the psychological uh, idea of like meeting people being with people I mean, here I am, I'm talking to you and I'm just, you know, I'm talking to my computer screen. Actually, I'm, I'm talking to this camera here. And, you know, the, the point is, it's not a real person. And so I, that's why I went to this conference yesterday because I, I wanted to see real people. And I wanted to see if I still am playing that tug of war game, you know, where you know, I tug, you tug, I tug, you tug, that kind of communication. Cause that's, that's what it's about when you're in performance. So I'm really eager to see what that's like. I mean, I, I get up in front of a couple people. Uh, there was like a hundred yesterday, which actually is much bigger than the theater that I'm going to be in. I mean, the theater I'm, under St. Mark's is this very, very intimate type of, uh, type of space and I mean really intimate so I mean not more than 40 40 50 people but so I was in a space yesterday where there was about a hundred and I think about 120 when it was all full and it just felt really like the ventilation and it was in a, in a big it was in a hotel and I just felt like, oh, I got to get used to being out in public. And the first time I, I performed in June, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I do these, these shows here, partly to, to, to prepare. Because I'm, you're live, I'm live, I'm talking to you. Of course, you look like one of my old suits or my Hawaiian shirts. Wow, I haven't worn that Hawaiian shirt in a long time. Um, Hawaiian shirts? Really? Come on. Uh, regular listeners of the show know that I like to meditate. So I've been thinking about this concept of letting go. A lot of people say, just let go. Let go. Let go. Just feel it happen and just let it happen. And it's sort of like 
right? One of the Buddha's first lessons, right? No striving, no desire, right? Because life is lived in suffering when, because of your desires, your striving. So you let go and just be. What does that mean? I, I'm figuring that out. But you know, you hear it enough times, and you say, "Oh, I get it now." Oh. It doesn't mean don't prepare. It doesn't mean like don't get ready. It just means just be. And magical things will happen. You got to believe that. You just have to believe that. And so, we end with a little meta loving kindness meditation. So, as I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy, and may you live with ease. Emil Guillermo here. Till next time. Mahal, Kita.